communist heaven is built as a top secret Soviet space mission in a planet far away from home. Control the jobs and resources, but keeping morale is one of the keys to become the best leader. Hi, it's Tarrant and Stella from the Dice Tower for how to play video series. In this video, we'll teach you Red Outpost, game designed by Raman Khorik and published by Imperial Publishing. We're showing you a prototype copy of the game, and so the art, rules, and components you see here may not be final. Let's get to the table. In Red Outpost, players are leaders of a new communist settlement on a distant, faraway planet. Controlling a common set of workers around the board, players will attempt to prove their worth as leaders by producing goods for the common good. But to be effective as leaders, players will also need to manage which workers they influence the most and the mood of those workers. The player who can best manage the colony's overall wealth and their influence and mood of their workers will be well placed to win the game. To set up the game, start by placing the board on the table. Place the six different worker meeples standing up in the barracks location, which is on the bottom right hand corner of the board. Then place a mood marker on the zero space next to each of the six workers' portraits. There are three decks of cards which come with the game. For your first game, you won't be using the special cards. Shuffle the fishing and the spaceship cards and place them on their locations on the board. Next, place the three morning block tokens and the three evening block tokens onto a location. They can go onto any locations except for the field kitchen and barracks. The rulebook gives you some recommended locations for your first game, or you can simply draw randomly by using the location cards from the special deck. Give each player a set of influence tokens and a crystal. You can return two tokens to the box in a three player game and three in a four player game. Each player places one disc on the five space of the victory point track and one on the first wedge of the production track. The phase marker goes on the morning wedge and the goods and remaining crystals are placed in supplies next to the board. Choose a first player and you're now ready to play. Red Outpost is played in two rounds and each round is played in five phases. Each phase is played in a series of player turns and the number of turns in each phase differs depending on the phase. We'll come back to the differences between the phases later and first focus on how you take your turns. There will also be a scoring phase at the end of each round and at the end of the game. Each player turn takes place over the following steps. First, choose one worker who is currently in the standing position to move. Then, move that chosen worker to another location on the board that is not currently occupied by any other worker. There are a couple of exceptions to that rule, but we'll go through those specifically later. Next, lay that worker down, making it unavailable for other players to use. As we'll see later, workers all stand back up again at the end of each phase. Next, take one of your influence discs and place it onto the portrait of the worker that you moved. The more times you move a worker during a round, the more influence you will have over that worker. Then, adjust the mood of the worker based on the icon shown in the top right corner of that action space. This is achieved by moving the worker's mood marker up for the happy face or down for the sad face. These icons can come in a few different forms. One that's by itself like this would simply mean an increase or decrease in mood. While an icon like this means that the worker would lose one mood, unless the worker placed is the matching worker, in this case yellow, in which case no mood change would occur. Similarly, in this location, the worker would lose two mood unless the black worker is placed, while here the red worker would lose one mood and all other workers would gain two mood. If a worker is supposed to gain or lose mood but is on the end of the track, simply leave the mood marker where it is. This will be important for your final scoring, since at the end of each of the game's two rounds, the player or players with the most discs on each worker will gain or lose points based on that worker's mood but we'll come back to that in more detail when we talk about scoring later in the video. Finally, after you've finished adjusting the mood, take the action that's printed on the space you've chosen. 
play then passes to the next player clockwise who does likewise, and so on until the end of the phase. So now let's look at what all the different action spaces do. First we'll talk about the production spaces. There are five production spaces on the board, and this is where you can go to produce goods for the colony and increase your own position on the production wheel. First there is the pasture where you can produce one wool. A worker going here loses one mood unless it is the shepherd. The farm works in the same way. You can produce one wheat but will lose one mood unless you send the farmer. In the middle of the board you'll find the coal mine where conditions are a bit harsher. If you send the miner he'll produce two coal at no loss of mood but any other worker will produce only one coal at a loss of two mood. In the bottom left of the board you'll find the lake where you can produce fish. But as with all fishing expeditions, success is not guaranteed. If you send any worker other than the fisherman, then that worker will lose one mood and flip the top card from the fish deck, gaining whatever's shown. This could be one fish, it could be two fish and an improvement in mood, or it could be nothing. If instead you send the fisherman, then you may first inspect the discard pile, shuffle everything back into the deck if you wish, then draw the top two cards and choose your favourite, discarding both. The fish deck contains these six cards and if the top three are ever in the discard pile at once, then you immediately reshuffle the deck. The final production location is the labour camp, which has a little bit of everything. Fields for farming, animals for wool, a pond for fishing, and fences and a guard tower to keep you working. Any worker who goes there will produce a wheat, a wool, and a fish, but will lose two mood. Regardless of which of these five production locations you use, any goods produced are for the community, and they are placed into the storehouse location in the centre of the board. However, you still get credit as a leader for the goods whose production you oversee. For each good produced, advance one wedge around the production wheel. You move straight from this fourth wedge to this first one, and when you do, gain two victory points and one crystal. Unlike the goods, the crystals do belong to the individual players. Another way to gain benefit from your production is to fill the storehouse. Whenever you place the third cube of any one type in the storehouse, remove those cubes and then place one of them in the leftmost open matching slot on this section at the bottom of the board. Immediately score points based on the column you place in. As you can see, the points for doing this will escalate as the game goes on. Once the first three columns are filled, you don't permanently fill the fourth column, you simply score the one point and then return the cube to the supply. And note that if you ever put four or more into the storehouse, you only remove three of them in this phase of scoring, leaving the fourth one for the next set. The next location is to scavenge the spaceship. Lose one mood and then draw the top spaceship card, gaining the benefit shown. This could be a good of your choice, it could be a specific good plus a crystal, or it could be nothing. The 12 spaceship cards are distributed like so, and so you have a pretty good chance of finding something useful. As before, any goods that you've scavenged are placed in the collective storehouse, and you can still score for sets of three. However, scavenging does not count as production, and so you do not move forward on the production wheel. The next action space is the storehouse itself, and you've got a couple of options here, but you may only take a single action. Firstly, you can choose to spend one of your personal crystals in order to add any one goods cube into the storehouse. Once again, this can trigger scoring a set of three, but it does not count as production, and so you don't move forward on the production wheel. Secondly, you may choose to discard any one goods cube from the storehouse in order to gain a crystal into your personal supply. Crystals can be spent on a couple of other actions which we'll get to shortly. The third option is that you can discard any one goods cube from the storehouse in order to increase one worker's mood by one step and decrease a different worker's mood by one step. You can make these mood changes immediately, trying to improve your own workers 
and harm the mood of ones that other players will win. A similar action is available at the beer house. The worker you place gains two mood, unless it is the red commissar, in which case she loses one mood, and then you may spend one of your own crystals to increase one worker's mood one step and decrease a different worker by one step. The next action space is administration, which is the natural home of the bureaucrat. If you visit this space with the bureaucrat, then you gain one crystal. If you visit this action space with any other worker, then first the bureaucrat gains one mood. Then choose any one influence disc belonging to a player other than yourself and move it to a different worker. This may try to move them away from high scoring workers or move them on to low scoring ones. The only restriction is that you cannot place a disc on or remove a disc from the worker that visited administration. In this case, these three discs on the yellow worker are off limits. The tenth action space is the Palace of the Soviets. If any worker other than the Commissar visits this location, then both that worker and the Commissar will gain one mood. If the Commissar visits, then there is no change in mood at all. Regardless of which worker visits, your action here is to place a crystal from your supply onto the square which matches your player colour. At the end of the game, the player who has placed the most crystals will gain 4 points, second most 2, and third most 1. But we'll cover this again in final scoring. The final two locations on the board are the field kitchen and the barracks. There's no specific action here, simply place your influence disc and gain one mood for that worker. Unlike the other spaces on the board, these two spaces can be occupied by multiple workers at the same time. However, the field kitchen can only be used during the lunch phase, which is the third phase of the round, and the barracks can only be used during the evening phase, which is the fifth phase of the round. And with that, we'll segue into talking about the different phases of each round. Each round has five phases. Morning, the first half of the day, lunch, the second half of the day, and evening. And you keep track using this marker. Each of the five phases works slightly differently, but the common feature between them is that at the end of each phase, you will stand all workers up in their current location, so that they'll all be standing for the start of the next phase, and at the end of each phase, you'll hand the first player marker clockwise to the next player. In the morning phase, you'll begin with all of the workers in the barracks standing up. Flip the three morning blocker tokens that you placed in setup over to the red side. You cannot move workers to those locations during this phase. Then each player will take exactly one turn during this phase. As such, not all workers will have moved during the morning. Any workers who haven't moved have had a sleep in in the barracks and this improves their mood, so increase the mood of unused workers from the morning phase by one step. This applies only to the morning phase and you can use this hour hand to remind yourself to do it. Then stand up all the workers and flip the morning blocker tokens back to the grey sides. In the first half of the day, you will continue taking turns until all six workers have been moved once each. This means each player will take three turns in a two-player game, two turns in a three-player game, and either one or two turns in a four-player game. None of the spaces are blocked out, except for the field kitchen and barracks, which again have their permanent restrictions. Stand the workers up at the end of the phase. The lunch phase works quite differently. Each player has one turn in the lunch phase, and the only location that a player can move a worker to is the field kitchen. In this way, the only thing you can do is choose a worker and gain influence and mood on that worker. You'll also be collectively unblocking some locations for the second half of the day. Then once again, stand the workers up. The second half of the day works exactly the same way as the first half, and continues until each of the six workers has been used once. Once again, this means players will take multiple turns and could take a different number of turns in the four player game. Then stand all the workers up for the evening. Each player will take one turn during the evening phase. The barrack space is now open, however, unlike with the field kitchen, this is not your only option during evening. 
you can send your worker to any other location not blocked out by one of these evening blockers to continue working long into the night. However, if you do send the worker to the barracks, they'll get an early night's sleep and an improvement in mood. Once this phase is over, you'll finish the round and you'll score for the worker's moods. When scoring the worker's moods, you'll score each of the six workers separately. Determine which player or players have the most discs on each portrait. Then that player or those players will score points equal to the current position of that worker's mood marker. So here brown would gain one point and pink and blue would each gain one point here but they'd both lose two points here. This is resolved for all six workers. You'll find an interesting balance between the production workers and the administrative workers. Workers doing production will tend to stay mood neutral or lose mood for most of their actions, but if you're taking those actions, you'll be aiming to score points from the production wheel. The actions of the administrative workers aren't always as good on the board. However, those two workers will gain mood based on the actions of other workers, and so this can be a good way of scoring points off their mood if you focus on gaining influence with those workers. Once you've finished scoring all of the moods for round one, you will completely reset this the same way it was at the start of the game. With all influence discs returned to their players and all mood markers reset to zero. You'll also move all six workers back to the barracks and stand them up. But crystals on the palace and goods on the storehouse, as well as goods on the track and position on the production wheel remains as it is from round to round. After the second round is finished, the game is over and proceed to final scoring. To complete final scoring, count up each player's crystals in the palace of the Soviets. The player with the most crystals gains four points, second most gains two, third most gains one, and fourth place, or anyone with no crystals, gains nothing. Ties are friendly, and so in this scenario, both the blue and brown players would be first and would each gain four points. Pink is third and gains one point. Players also gain points for any leftover crystals they hold at a rate of one point per two crystals. The player with the highest score wins, and in the event of a tie, whoever has the most leftover crystals wins the game. If still tied, victory is shared. As an optional extra, you may choose to play the game with the special cards. There are 18 special cards, one for each worker and one for each location. And in setup, you'll shuffle each of these separately and then deal one of each at random to each player. The cards you are dealt are placed face up in front of you and they give you two special abilities which only you have access to during the game. The one on the location card will be valid any time you send a worker to that location and the one on the worker will be valid every time you take an action with that worker. This adds some extra asymmetry to the game and I'll leave you to read the full details for each of those cards on the final page of the rulebook. And that's how to play Red Outpost. We hope that you enjoyed the video. At the time of filming, Red Outpost is about to be launched on Kickstarter, so we'll put the link in the description below when it is live, so you can check it out. If you have any questions, comments or feedback, please write them in the comments section below. Until next time! Thanks so much for watching another Dice Tower video. If you enjoy our videos, subscribe to the channel for more fun, comprehensive board game coverage. Also, consider joining us at one of our events. Come to Dice Tower Retreat, a small, intimate gathering where gaming is king. Join us for Dice Tower Cruise, the largest board game cruise. Attend Dice Tower West in Las Vegas for gaming fun on the West Coast, or Dice Tower East in Orlando in sunny Florida. Dice Tower Conventions, the friendliest gaming conventions on Earth. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower.